Well, good evening again, and uh, a very warm welcome. Uh, a warm welcome to, of course, all of us that are here in Carloway, and uh, an especial warm welcome uh, to this evening to anyone who's watching us online, and to anyone from Brighton, especially, who may be <laughs> viewing this live stream online. A big hello uh, from all of us uh, that are here uh, in Carloway on the Isle of Lewis. We've had a fabulous time and uh, we've enjoyed ourselves immensely, uh, spiritually, and uh, just seeing your beautiful island. So the warmest of welcomes uh, this evening. So we're going to start with the first hymn, Praise My Soul. Can I interject? Could I have something on the microphone, please? Can I interject? This wasn't planned. But in response to what's happened just now, we just want to praise God and give thanks that Jimmy Craig is in church after a long time, after many trials, been in hospital, broken his hip, done a lot of damage to himself, but God has restored him, and he's got the will and the strength of a 90-year-old man to come to church with his daughter and family. So we praise God for that blessing, don't we? We rejoice with you today. So let's pray. Let's be hungry. Let's be hungry for the presence of God tonight. Heavenly Father, as we draw near to you tonight, 
we know from your word that you will also draw near to us. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would draw near to us to this evening, that your presence and your power, your spirit, would draw near to each one of us as we hunger and thirst after you and draw near to you. All our prayers we ask in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And our next hymn is My Jesus, My Saviour. <laughs> evening is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5, uh, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. 
This is the word of the Lord. Our next hymn is uh, number 200, Great is Thy Faithfulness. It's a joy, my last time preaching here in Callaway, and it's uh, thank you for the invitation and for your incredible hospitality uh, to all of us that have come up from Brighton. And uh, it, it's really, it's, it's a joy to preach in this pulpit, honestly. As a preacher, there's a freedom and a presence to share the gospel with you all. Uh, I don't know my lineage from my father's side for one reason or another. And uh, my sister reminded me today that a year or two ago she did an ancestry check to 
see with the DNA where we come from. And uh, I hope you'll be happy to know that I'm 28% Scottish. <laughs> Which I think is pretty good. They even they even know where from. In fact, I'm, the other 28% is uh, Irish. So actually, I'm not English at all. So there you are. Well, I want to share. I want to share th th this evening on trying to understand life in the Christian life. There's all sorts of philosophies out there, young and old, Stoicism, Hedonism, trying to make sense of life. And as Christians, we need to understand life, its hardships, its difficulties, its suffering. And sometimes it's mysteries to know what is the Lord doing? How does the Lord work um, in all of these things? There's a wonderful quote from Corrie ten Boom that I guess many of you will know who was sent to Ravensbrück concentration camp in the war for hiding Jews with her sister who was murdered there. And she said that when a train goes through a dark tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off. You sit still and you trust the engineer. And uh, Corrie ten Boom became very well known all over the world. Godly woman, a woman of faith, a woman who knew her savior, a woman who was able to forgive. But she was molded and shaped. Her Christian life was molded and shaped. She became the godly woman that we read about and see through intense pain and suffering. Now, that tells us something. Someone, one of the church fathers, he shaped me when I was 19 years old, was an American man called John Wimber. It doesn't matter whether you know him or not, but he, he was a man of some character and ability and anointing. And someone came up to him one time and they said, can you lay hands on me? because I'd like some of the anointing that's on your life. And uh, John, being very kindly, he's, very, he's an American, but he, he, you know, he, he wasn't so brash. He was a, a laid-back American, let's say. And he, he said, yeah, come, come. I'll. So he put his hands on his head. And he began to pray for him, and he said, Lord, this man's life, make it less easy. Bring hardships into his life and difficulties and pain and suffering, Lord. Take away the things that he depends on in his life. And this man, he, he, he got John Wimber's hands and pushed them away, you know. But John Wimber knew, as you know, getting older, that life is not easy or straightforward. In fact, life for everyone at one level or another is tough and difficult. Those of you that are older will verify that. But you always know that God comes through, that God provides, that God's mercies are new every morning. And, and that's the dichotomy of the Christian life that non-Christians cannot understand because they have no place in their suffering. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a lover of Jesus, you, you have to bear the suffering without him. It, it isn't redemptive. It isn't helpful in your life. It doesn't change your life. But as Christians, it will, and it does. And really, that's what I want to look at, the, the Christian life. Um, and to see that suffering is really normal. It's, it's quite a shock for us as we grow up. I have two girls and my daughter's 10. And of course, there's little niggles um, at school. But generally, she's had a happy life. Many children have a happy life and should have a happy life. But as they enter adulthood, as they enter life, it can come as somewhat as a shock. And the best thing that we can do for our children, the best thing we can do for our children is to teach them Godly ways, yes, but to try, do everything we can to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Those of you that are younger here today, the best decision in your life is to hand it over to Jesus. And to hold hands with Jesus in your life. Because you'll need him. And he's there for you in everything. So in, in this uh, particular passage here, as Paul's writing, no one more than the Apostle Paul would understand this. Remember at the very beginning of the Apostle Paul's life, as he'd had this encounter and Ananias is sent to lay hands on him for him to be filled with the Spirit. And Ananias doesn't want to go. He's heard about this man. He's a violent persecutor of the church. And the Lord tells him, no, this is my chosen instrument. And he's going to suffer very much uh, for my gospel. And so Ananias went. And Paul did suffer all his life, <coughs> more than anyone. And... Uh, he even used it to 
authenticate his ministry as an apostle. The super apostles, of course, wanted an easy ride, an easy life. They, they were very eloquent and very powerful and promised blessings, I guess. I don't know what kind of heresy they were preaching to the Corinthians. But Paul, when he defends himself, says, look at my life. And guess who he looks like in his suffering? Guess who the Apostle Paul most resembles when he's been beaten or shipwrecked or slandered or any of these other things that went on? He points to the man on the cross and says, I look like him. I'm humiliated. I'm rejected. I'm being beaten. And he looks like him. And that continued for a great deal of time into the early church where, where people um, actually wanted to be, or it was, a, it was um, a badge of merit being a Christian and being persecuted because they looked like Jesus. They looked like him. In the West, we've chosen other things. And the, the blessings of God as somehow being merit badges. But I don't think they are. Not in the way um, that they're being described today. And so suffering is difficult. But it is normative. And it does things to you that nothing else will do. Because Jesus is very serious about us. He wants us to look like him. The Father wants us to be holy. He wants us to look like his Son, Jesus Christ. But our flesh craves comfort, ease, food. I've eaten too much this week, I must confess, um, as uh, your Reverend <laughs> Maskell here will uh, agree with, I think. But they're the things we like. I, I confessed to my church the other day, if I, if I struggle with anything, it's wanting an easy life. I want it to be easy, but you know that when you look at your own history, and we, we, you know, we were shown the black houses, we saw how people lived 70 years ago, eking a living off the land, it was very difficult. Oh, but weren't they godly people? Weren't they amazingly godly? Didn't they hear from God? Weren't they walking with Jesus? Weren't they of character, the kind of character that you and I want? I wish there was an easy way that God did it. But this is how he chooses to do it with his church. And he's very, very <coughs> serious about his church. He's very serious about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, I, I know there's all kinds of people of status and power saying all sorts of things. Let them. But for you and I, let's contend and believe for this gospel that we hold to that is so precious. So Paul is um, talking to them here in Romans 5 in language that they'll understand, but of course, they've gained access into this grace um, through faith. It's the only way anyone comes in. God gives this amazing faith to us for justification, and we, we believe in Jesus. And once we believe, once we do that, doesn't love just fill our hearts? You know, I spoke to, we, I didn't speak to, we listened to the Reverend McLeod from Barvis the other day. And he described his moment of salvation as he finally at two o'clock in the morning gave his life, handed over his life, as God was contending for his life. And when he woke up in the morning, everything was new. Everything he looked like was new. We had a girl in our church some years ago, and she'd started coming to our church, and uh, that was fine. <laughs> Rosie, and she was an English teacher, so we... We, at that point, we you know, were able to record her. She's somewhat elo eloquent. And we recorded her soon after her salvation. So it was a very raw testimony of what had happened to her. But she came along. She was not a Christian. She's living with a boyfriend. I, she tried everything, she said. If the boyfriend was sporty, she'd be sporty. If the boyfriend was intellectual, she'd be intellectual. If the boyfriend liked football, she'd like football. And she said, to, but, but inside she was empty. She had a boyfriend now, but she was empty of everything. She, she wanted something more, and she thought, maybe someone said, go to church. So she came to our church, and she would listen to me preach. And she said, I like Chris's preaching, but how, how do you believe? I don't believe. How do I believe this? How do I get in? What do I do, was, was Rose's testimony and one day she 
came to the front, not to receive prayer or anything, but uh, she, she wanted to acknowledge someone who'd spoken that morning. And I said, oh, Rosie, you'd like some prayer? <coughs> Prayed for her. Began to weep, to cry and cry. And she said that as she left, as she walked up one of the miserable looking, dark, dirty roads of Brighton, she said it had never looked cleaner or more beautiful in her whole life she was born again. Jesus had saved her. It's glorious when he does that. And Paul describes this process, you see, when you come to believe, God gives you this belief in him. He fills you with his spirit and he changes you. There's nothing more glorious in life than when God does that. And Rosie, this is at least a decade ago, is going on with Jesus. She found a man in the church, she got married, and fortunately they moved to California, and now it's all Dakota, Dakota, but what can you do? What can you do? These people that you disciple and train, they move away, but there we are. But I'm still in touch with them, and they're doing well. And... Um, and so we, we boast in this hope that, that Paul's talking of, this glory of God. And this, this suffering, this is, this is Paul's point, you see. The suffering produces perseverance. The perseverance, character, character, hope. There are things in your life that I don't know. I don't know any of you. But anyone who's over 25 or 30, or, I know you'll have stories for me of tremendous, difficult things in life. Some of them that are mysteries, some of it that you will not understand this side of eternity. But you can trust Jesus. You can trust him. You can lay your life before him, even when you don't understand. My friend Rick, whose son died at 32, he doesn't understand. But he does trust Jesus. That's the part of the disciple. And so here it produces perseverance, this wonderful word, character. Character. God produces in us character. He makes us like himself. Right from wrong. Able to forgive. Able to serve. Able to be of low, lowly in how we think of ourselves compared to others. And this hope, and then he says it, it doesn't put us to shame because God's poured his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that he's given us. And so here's the dichotomy of the Christian life, that God pours his love into us, this incredible love. I, I remember it only too well at 19, what that experience of being filled with a love that I, I just beyond anything I could describe today. And then finding out that, that, that suffering is still part and parcel of life. And honestly, at 57, I thank God for the suffering and the difficulties of life. Because were it not for that, I would be weak as a Christian. I wouldn't be any good. I wouldn't be any, certainly I wouldn't be any good preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But when you've suffered, when you keep on going, when you trust Jesus more, character of God will be formed in you and shaped in you, as will the love of God. And importantly, you will have a message for other people. You will be able to understand their afflictions and their suffering. Because if you haven't suffered, if, you ha if you're not in any way afflicted by anything, what, what, what do you have to say to anyone else? What message do you have to say? Well, I've come to Christ and he's prospered me. My business is booming, my children are wonderful, my wife is the best you could imagine, I've <coughs> bought another house and we have three holidays a year. I mean, that isn't the message, is it? That God somehow wants to bless us? No. In fact, um, I like Ephesians um, chapter 1, where Paul talks about the blessings that are given to us in Christ Jesus. And I'm not discounting material blessings but they are so utterly insignificant to the spiritual blessing of having your sins forgiven you they are insignificant whatever goes on in this life the spiritual blessings are the ones and so often we're 
caught up in the West at looking at material blessing. And it's so utterly foolish. It's so utterly stupid. And will God do those things? He will. He will be faithful. He will provide. Because if you seek first the kingdom of God, all these things. What things? The things that you need to live by. But first and foremost, God wants your heart. He wants your heart. He wants you to love him. Because he absolutely adores you. And when you love him, when your heart is for him, there's no idol in your life in the way. Then all these things will be added unto you. And so Paul says that Christ in Ephesians chapter 1 verse uh, 3, he's blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. There's the blessing. Every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. You know that? That when we meet Christ one day face to face and even a, we're holy and blameless in his sight. You're blameless. I mean, blameless. Isn't that, isn't that glorious, Kenny? We are blameless in his sight. All my sin has been taken away. Everything is gone. That's the blessing of being a Christian. And then God does the work. He's, he's done the work of of, of uh, taking away our sin and now the work of making us and forming us and redeeming us from the, the muck and the mire that we so op often stand in that we would be worthy ambassadors of Jesus Christ because that's who we are and God doesn't play games he's not playing a game with your life he didn't choose you by accident you matter to him more than all the gold in the universe, all the tea in charge. You matter incredibly to him. He loves you. He's for you. And yes, you look at the suffering and you think, well, what, what, what's going on? But those of you that have children, of course you spoil them a bit, don't you? But you give them boundaries. You don't let them do what they want. You certainly don't give them everything that they ask for. You're really in trouble then when they're teenagers, aren't you? Of course not. God doesn't do it with us. He's a loving father, a loving person. And suffering is part of this dispensation. It's part of our life today. And so when James talks in James chapter 1, doesn't he? He said, uh, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials and difficulties of all kinds. I mean, who does that? When the finances aren't quite where they should be. Your wife's told you a home truth you don't want to listen to. Or whatever. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Pure joy when you face trials and difficulties. You see, that's the Christian life. If we could only embrace it, if we could only understand it. And like I've said before, my problem in my life, the sin in my I, I want a comfortable life. I mean, I'm living in it. You know, with central heating, I've, I'm, I'm living with washing machines and dishwashers. I'm, I'm living with Tesco's around the corner. I haven't got to go out and eke a living off the land. Life is, is easier, but the flesh must be con constrained. And God has used difficulties I know in my life, and I haven't understood them all at the time, as he is in every single person who's watching on live stream or who's sitting here today. That is how it works. Paul gives us the most biographical account. Check the watch. Where are we? Oh, I've got plenty of time. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Paul checks. Paul is um, Paul's most biographical. Understanding the Apostle Paul. What is he like? He's incredibly tenacious, bold with this gospel. He, he takes it and wants to share it everywhere he goes. Establishing churches, discipling people. Understanding Jesus in, in a way that is, is incredible, really. It's a gospel that he received, he says to Galatians. It's a gospel that, that came to him, you know. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he says this, he said in, in verse 9, We felt we'd received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Paul's saying he was taken above and beyond. Sometimes people say, oh, God won't put on your plate more than you can cope with. That isn't true. God will 
put on your plate more than you can cope with so that you can see who it is that's looking after you. Above, just he, he, he will just take you beyond. We have a... I, I travelled with an old lady. She must have been in her 80s back from Moscow. Not that long ago. But we could fly back from Moscow. She was an older lady. She was a strong evangelical. And she said the, the worst things that have come into the church, and one of them, she said, was psychology. Too much psychology. Not enough of the Word of God. Because the Word of God explains how we're to live the Christian life. What we're to expect from the Christian life, you see. And so, Paul understands that the difficulties, he felt under the sentence of death, that means he, he expected to die at any moment. Why? Because God wanted him to trust him more. God wanted Paul to know that when he'd reached the end of himself, when he was utterly and completely strengthless, when he had no strength left, God was taking care of him. God was looking after him. The church has never been weaker in my lifetime than right now. We're weaker and weaker and weaker, but God, God will show us his strength when it's his time and in due course, because it's always that way. The second reason, apart from just being able to be dependent, in verse 11 he says, as you help us by your prayers. You see, when one person suffers, we can pray for them. We can pray for them. When you get older, you're gonna, your body's going to be a bit more infirm. We can pray. We can pray for one another. And people were praying for Paul as he went through all of these kinds of uh, difficulties that were so common to life and understanding in his life. And then lastly, Paul explains um, in 1 Peter um, chapter 4, he says, but rejoice in so much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. I think, and I've been to some of the poorer nations, you have nothing really. Nothing, no, not access to anything that we have. Goodness me, we, we must have 50 choices of cheese to eat. Choices of butter. The choices that we're given, of cars and I've been with people that just have a couple of cups and a mud hut, really, or a, nothing. And, and this works, you see, overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Why? Because then you, you're looking forward to eternity. When you're suffering, when life is hard, when you're under this sentence, you're looking forward to eternity. Death is not the end. Death is the beginning. One day, maybe, I'll be able to speak Gaelic, the language of heaven. Not this side of eternity, but maybe um, the next ones. And so that's what I wanted to share today, to, to persevere, to contend, to keep going. And to understand what, the, what Paul, what the Bible is saying about suffering. Our Saviour suffered, incredibly. But so will you and I. In different ways, everyone has their own burden. Everyone has it, it's different for us all. But persevere, because the perseverance will bring hope. Sorry, the perseverance will, will build you in character. The character will give you hope. And at the end of everything, you'll be with your Savior forever and ever. Amen? Amen. 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 So, let's end with <coughs> Psalm se number 72.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, that tonight it will impact us at the very core of who we are. And Lord, whenever we've suffered badly, whenever we've got angry, whenever we've tried to run away, forgive us, O oh God. Change us, O oh God. Give us your heart, O oh God, that we become ever more like you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace.